In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee, O heavenly King. Comfort the spirit of truth, who are everywhere, present and fill us all. Thanks, treasure, blessings, and gear of life. Come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save us also, good one. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy on us and save us. Amen. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, because I will have to leave around uh, five before seven. Uh, or seven o'clock uh, to be exactly. I will have to keep it this time short. However, you will be able to watch this uh, as well on YouTube. Uh, I, for now, I just wanted to cover the most important topics that we wanted to talk today. The first one is, what is the meaning of the words unto the ages of ages? Amen. So this is a question that was asked recently. So I will just give you the brief uh, explanation. You probably know already that every time when we give an exclamation in the church uh, by exclamation we are referring to the fact that when we uh when the, let's say the deacon says again and again peace let us pray to the lord also known as the little litany towards the end uh of that um, um towards the end of that uh litany we are Actually, the priest uh, or the bishop, but in, in many cases, the priests, they would say, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Almost every service of the church that is started by the priest uh, in, the, in the Orthodox Church finishes with this word, unto the ages of ages. Amen. So, logically, people will ask, What is the meaning? Why, why do we say unto the ages of ages? And even though we can give just simple answer, it refers to the eternity. That God dwells into, lives into the eternity. Also, these uh, words unto the ages have multiple meanings. I would just now focus on the historical aspect of it. So, for example, the final exclamation, which concludes uh, in many Orthodox liturgical prayers, the end of ages, Amen. Uh, we are, of course, we're getting so used to hearing it, uh, th this phrase, that we probably don't even consider where it comes from and why it is in our prayers. Uh, it's very logical to kind of sometimes even not think about this, we just go along with it. Um, the, there is a one uh, a writer, for example, David uh, Inston Brewer, in his book, Traditions of the Rabbis from the Era of the New Testament, and he examines the many aspects of the Jewish uh, practice from the time of Christ, and he points out that the feud had emerged between the Sadducees and the Pharisees about how properly to conclude a blessing in the temple. Just to explain you, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were people who were in a constant fight with each other. They were arguing mainly about the, uh, the afterlife. Is there a life after our death? And uh, in this kind of eschatological perspective, they would be very um, serious in how they were accepted. The Sadducees were the ones who believed that there was no afterlife that everything that we have is here, while the Pharisees believe that there is an afterlife, they even believed in the resurrection of the dead and so forth. They were the main political parties, if you will, in the philosophical systems in the Jewish society, who would always argue about theological issues. And uh, one of the most important issues was the eschatological issue, of what happens uh, to us when we die, uh, the end, the messianic question, and many other topics. So because of this argument that they had, they were constantly fight. The only time they were united was uh, when uh, Christ came and they, out of envy, anger, hypocrisy, and many other things as we can witness and see and read in, in the gospel, Christ enters into these uh, arguments with them. And he sometimes, not sometimes, very often, he calls them the hypocrites. He debunks them and uh, puts them in their place because they were abusing the word of God. So they, at this time, even before Christ, but during the time of Christ, they were arguing about how do we finish the prayers in the temple? Should we say up to the ages of ages? That was uh, the correct way how the Pharisees thought, while the Sadducees said no, and, and uh, they became uh, an issue. So then uh, apparently were different practices for the end of the temple prayer. Amen, as we always say, unto the ages of ages, amen, was one traditional ending, but also at one time the response was, blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever. Uh, the Sadducees, those who did not believe in the afterlife, 
and so interpret forever to mean until the this age ended, referring to the age now, that there you can see, for example, the beginning of the heresy of Heliaism and uh, the, the beliefs of even now modern um, faiths or religions who believe in the Heliastic um, kingdom of heaven on earth in a way. They uh, wanted to reserve the word forever, but understood only as when uh, the, the, that kind of forever means that forever here on earth, not on the kingdom of heaven. So um, this is believed because uh, for them, the forever meant until this age ended, since there is only this age, but nothing beyond this age. So the Pharisees then change the ending of the prayer forever and ever. That's what it means unto ages of ages. Because then it referred to both this age and to the age to come, which is the Sadducees didn't believe in. So this was a compromise to have unto the ages of Israel between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. It was a necessary force for the Sadducees to have to pray for the age to come. So Christianity only follows that uh, the beliefs of the Pharisees regarding the afterlife, the resurrection and the world to come, kept the phrase unto the ages of ages, and amen as a conclusion. As part of uh, the, the Christian prayers, in order to affirm the belief in the afterlife and the kingdom which is to come. You see, the Orthodox faith, the Christianity is only focused in this ambience of the expectation of the kingdom of God. And our faith is not a present faith. It's not, the faith uh, it's not a faith of this time, but rather one eschatological, that it's coming to us from the future. So the words unto the ages of ages were naturally incorporated into the, um, the Christian tradition. So it was not about copying and pasting it from the Pharisee or the Jewish tradition, but also believing into the ages of ages. Christ did not promise the kingdom on earth. He promised us the kingdom of heaven. So the split uh, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees is mentioned in the Acts, book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 23, verse 69, where St. Paul himself, who was a Pharisee, as you know, he was the one who persecuted the Christians in the beginning before his conversion takes advantage, St. Paul, of the disagreement to turn the two Jewish sects against each other. And we can see also this in Matthew uh, 22, verse 23 to 33. The phrase, unto the ages of ages, occurs in the New Testament in Matthew 6, 13, for example, in some ancient uh, Greek manuscripts specifically, in Romans 1, 25, in Galatians 1, 5, Ephesians 3, 21, 1 Timothy 1.17, Hebrews 13.21, 1 Peter 4.11, and frequently in the book of Revelation, just to name a few of them. So of course, we can go even back into the Old Testament and we'll see the words unto the ages of ages were referring to the eternity of God. So the logical question would arise uh, about this. What is the meaning of the ages of ages? Is there just that historical? No. Uh, it has also uh, uh, an apostolic, uh, yes, I'm sorry, uh, uh, eternal meaning, theological meaning. The words unto the ages of ages are telling a paradox that God is timeless, dimensionless, and that God exceeds any ages because he is the creator of time and space. And as such, he lives in a constant present, in a constant state of uh, continuously being into the past, into the present, and into the future. For him, the past, the present, the future are one timeline. There is no, because from the perspective of eternity, they don't make sense. They are not real. So that's why unto the ages of ages, when the priest is saying those words, he is referring to the, etern to the eternal God and to the time where there is no time, to the timelessness. Uh, it's hard for us to comprehend, to process this um, understanding uh, the, of time because eternity has a, a very powerful, very deep meaning that uh, for us it, it can sometimes have very superficial understanding. For example, our time is a linear. What happened yesterday uh, is gone. What happened five minutes ago, I cannot bring it back. What's going to happen in five minutes from now, or five years or five centuries from now also, I don't have control of that because only God knows what's going to happen. 
I only have the control of what's going on now. And that's why every second and every moment of us, we experience eternity in the state of present. Yes, we grow old. Yes, we, we see the time passes. Things are changing around us, inside of us. But in reality, the time as we know it is a human construct. Uh, you know that even in physics, uh, when Einstein talks about the theory of relativity, he proves that through the motion of certain objects uh, relative to the to their environment, the time uh, slows down or it can speeds up. For that reason, uh, we even have scientific proof that time doesn't uh, doesn't make a lot of sense to us, or we can fully understand it in that regard. So, <laughs> this whole topic, unto the ages of ages, from the theological perspective, it reveals to us that the God that we believe in is timeless, dimensionless, spaceless, and he lives in a constant state of present from the perspective of eternity. So there is no moment or point in the history of the past or in the future where God is not present. Being omnipresent, ever present, he is the Lord of all of the ages. So the words unto the ages of ages is basically, in a very mystical way, sacramental way, us confessing our faith in the God that we believe in. So when we say, blessed is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages, we are saying that we believe in a God who is with us right now, at this moment, that's why we are praying to him, but he is the same God who was and who shall come. We can always come back to the words of prophet Moses when he sees God on Mount Sinai and he asks him about his name which was a very logical question because in Egypt they all had names for their gods but God says to him I am who I am he says I am Yahweh and Yahweh literally means when you go from the Hebrew translation I am the one who is constantly is who was and who is coming towards you and for us, it's hard to understand this. And that's why God doesn't have a name. God has multiple names. One of the names that God has is Alpha and Omega. This is what we talked about last Tuesday when we were talking about the book of Revelation. The other names that God has besides Alpha and Omega, we call him love. Uh, we call God the merciful, the good shepherd. And we give all these attributes to describe who God is. One of the names is also Amen. God is the Amen. He's the, the beginning and the end of all things. He's the confirmation of our existence. Why? Because only God has true ontological existence. Ontological existence means God truly is the only real one who exists. All of us, including the angels and the demons and everything that was ever created, regardless at what point of the, of the timeline of, of existence, meaning the history, the past, the present, and the future, we have all been created from some sort of a beginning. Only God is the one that we call beginningless. So when we say the words, unto the ages of ages, amen, we're referring to God who doesn't have an end, who doesn't, cannot be contained in a name, it cannot, cannot be contained in time, it cannot be contained in space. All of that being said, God is, for us, the past, the present, and the future. Everything is God. He is the Pantocratoras, or he is the one who holds everything into his own existence. So the words, unto the ages of ages, it doesn't only have a historical purpose. This is something that the Jewish people felt, they knew, it was passed on from one prophet to another prophet, from one generation to another generation, and it entered into the Jewish understanding, theological thought, and how they would pray. The feud that they have, the argument that the Pharisees and the Sadducees had was because they had a very either spiritual or materialistic understanding of the existence of God. So the Sadducees were actually cheering up for a political leader, the political Messiah who will come and be, will be delivering them from the oppression of the Romans, and that he will establish the new kingdom of David, and so on and so forth. And the Pharisees later became the same believers into this. However, uh, the Pharisees still believed in the resurrection of the dead. They believed that there is 
this life is not the end, uh, but rather there is an even more abundance of life after we die. For that reason, uh, this uh, compromise unto the ages of ages was indulged even before Christ. And in the time of Christ and after Christ, when the church was established on the day of the Pentecost, it only became a natural part of all the prayers that the apostles used to say. So uh, basically the most ancient um, apostolic blessing that we have is the one that we call blessed is the kingdom of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit now and never and unto the ages of ages amen god eternal god beginningless god without end without space who is not bounded by space time or any kind of constraint uh, we can talk about this for a very long time, and we will not be able to answer some of the other more important questions we want to cover today. So if I was at least a little bit uh, clear about this, I hope that it will give a, a satisfying answer to those who ask this question. But let's move to another uh, uh, topic. Of course, at any time, if you feel I just found out that I don't have to go uh, later, it's so we can stay even a little bit longer. I was trying, I would like to cover the other question that I was being asked and I want to cover because I would like to, starting from next Tuesday, uh, to continue with the book of Revelation because all of these questions that we're answering from time to time on, on Tuesdays are important because they will be all a part of our studies of the book of Revelation following the book of Father Athanasius Metilineo. So the question we want to answer today is why cannot women become priests? So let me just share my uh, screen with you. There are reasons why uh, the orthodox church has this position and i hope uh, today we might give an answer to some of them uh, i hope you can all see the, the slides here try to um, put into the reading viewing it's a little bit slow the computer but we'll answer so this question was asked to me even a long time ago certain people asked me about why cannot in the orthodox church women become priests and this is a very Good question, since in the past few decades, we have seen so many uh, people um, who are cheering for this so-called reform or liberalization of the theology, the theology of the church. And we see a lot of Protestants, a lot of Anglican churches, and then different denominations, they all have introduced women into their priesthood. But it is important for us to know try to answer a question about the priesthood and try to explain why women cannot be become priests according to the orthodox theology of the church. So uh, the other question we can ask is, should women join the priesthood? And uh, this is a very uh, important topic. That we'll try. Let me see, why is this not uh, One of the answers uh, that I believe that most of the orthodox people uh, and among them, there are many women. If you ask them the same question, we'll answer very simply. And they will say, it was always like that. And this is enough for a good answer on its own. I know it sounds funny, but if you ask any babushka uh, who is, uh, let's say, 80 years old, and he's, if he, or some yaya, uh, why women cannot become priestesses? Because it was always like this. We never had to think about things like this. And this is, you will see why it's a very good answer. However, we will give some theological, not some, a theological answers and practical reasons why this cannot be the case. It is true that women cannot become priests or priestesses in the Orthodox Church, and this teaching and understanding in the Orthodoxy comes from its ancient holy tradition. It comes from the time of the apostles and remained unchanged to this day. However, we see a trend today, as I've mentioned, in the last decades, especially here in the West, uh, the Western Hemisphere of the world, specifically in many Protestant, Anglican communities, and so forth. And there are even attempts in some of the Roman Catholic churches to introduce diaconesses and many other forms of uh, clergy that comes from women in order to break free from the burdens of the old traditions, as, as they call it. So. Women in these uh, denominations, they become priests or priestesses. For this reason, it is important for the Orthodox to know 
for the Orthodox Christian to understand, since we must also witness our faith among the heterodox, those who are non-Orthodox, to know what the teaching of the church is and listen to the reasons why women are not being ordained into the mystery of the holy priesthood in the Orthodox Church. So the reasons that we have are theological and practical. This is why I'm very glad that uh, I can answer this question uh, since it was requested, uh, as I've said, by some people. And we will try, I will try to give as much as the time allows me to, to, to do so, because this is not a topic that we would like to just go through, but it's important to, to answer this question. So there will be no oh, uh, stones unturned or questions unanswered. Feel free at the end of this to also, if you have questions, to, uh, to ask me and we'll talk. So you probably know that in the Orthodox Church, there are two types of priesthood. And uh, the first one is the royal priesthood and the liturgical priesthood. In the royal priesthood, we have all the faithful. It includes all the Orthodox Christians who were baptized through the mystery of the Holy Baptism and the Holy Chrismation, or Miropomazania, and are being called to offer themselves and their whole life to God. Remember, just as we say in the Little Litany, let us commend one another and our whole life unto Christ our God. They were saying this at almost every uh, divine liturgy. Every Vespers, every Matins, we are always saying the words, let us commend one another, each other, and our whole life unto Christ our God. Because we, as Orthodox Christians, as a royal priesthood, and being named as such by St. Paul himself, we are the one who are witnessing and serving all the time Christ and serving on the altars of our heart. That's why... Uh, we will talk about the royal priesthood in great details, and you will see how magnificent the royal priesthood is and what it actually means. They're also, um, uh, they're also called the, to the, the, the royal priesthood, all of us. We are called to witness and proclaim our resurrected Lord and our holy Orthodox faith to the others, not by force, not by imposing it, but by rather witnessing it in the way how we live our life. This is equally important and obligatory for the male and the female in the Orthodox Church. So before we move on, you see in the first slide here, I have the royal priesthood on the top. You see the priests are serving. That's, no, I'm sorry, that's the liturgical priesthood. And underneath you have the people who is the royal priesthood. On the second slide, I just want to say a few words about something when it comes to the priesthood to, for you to understand what is the holy ordination, the mystery, the sacrament of the hierotonia or the ordination, and what is the hierarchy of ordination, that's the, what we call the liturgical priesthood, and what is the royal priesthood or the hierarchy of jurisdiction, actually what is the hierarchy of jurisdiction comes out from the hierarchy of hierotonia of ordination, and what is the difference between those two. So you probably have heard the words bishop, archbishop, uh, metropolitan, patriarch, but they all look the same. Or you sometimes you hear the words presbyter, proto-presbyter, archpriest, proto-presbyter, uh, proto-namesnik, all these different words. And you think, but they all look like priests. We all refer to them as a father. Uh, you say, we can hear the words deacon, proto-deacon, archdeacon, like there's one deacon and one diaconate, but why do we have all these different names for the people? Well, here is the reason. When we say there is a hierarchy of ordination, this is only includes three, uh, three ranks. The first one is, of course, is the bishop. The second one is the priesthood or the priests. And the third one is the diaconate, the deacons. The bishop is <clears throat> the first full successor of what we call the apostolic succession as it was given from their pre predecessors. I've told you before, if you want to trace a certain bishop where he came from, who, was, who ordained him, and if you trace the bishop who ordained that bishop, if you go into the past, you will come back to the time of the apostles. So, for example, in the Serbian church, we, 
our bishops were ordained from, uh, from the previous generations, the previous generations, and we'll come back to the 12th and the 13th century, we back, go back to San Saba, who formed in a way and gave birth to the Serbian Orthodox Church. While San Saba himself was ordained by bishops who were then by their bishops from Andrew, the first Paul, the apostle. This is called the hierarchy of hierotonia or ordination, while the bishops, because they serve in one diocese, in one place, they ordain priests or presbyters, presbyters and deacons who would serve in their name, of course, in place of Christ in certain parishes so that they can perform the holy mysteries. And that's why the priests, when we serve the liturgy, always at the very central part of the liturgy, after the consecration of the gifts, we say, among the first, O Lord, remember his grace, our most um, reverend bishop, Irene, or whoever the bishop is, we are serving under, because we, the priests, we serve in the name of our bishop. A priesthood cannot exist without the apostolic succession of the episcopal. So there, the hierarchy of ordination has bishops, priests, and deacons. While the hierarchy of jurisdiction, this is the, uh, the, the, the confusing part for most of us when we see, when we hear the words archbishop, patriarch, metropolitan, protodeacon, archdeacon, protopresbyter, and so forth and so on, those are the names from what we call the hierarchy of jurisdiction. When the church expanded, when the church was all around the Roman Empire, and it had to cover so many new converts, so many people who were coming, uh, becoming Christians, there was a need of organization of the church in such a way that it will be um, uh, open to everyone. And at the same time, servicing the needs, the spiritual needs of the new people who were joining the church. So for that reason, the church started organizing itself in the jurisdictions. That's why we have, for example, let's say in our church, many, many, many bishops, but we have one or two metropolitans and one patriarch. But in no way, shape, or form, if someone is a patriarch, is higher in power, let's say, than any of the regular bishops. Because every bishop, when he serves the liturgy, he serves in the name of Christ. He's in the place of Christ. He's not the vicar of Christ, but he's the, what we call the ek prosopos to Christu. He is the representative of Christ. He, the bishops and the priests, they represent the deacons, the clergy, they represent the visible um, uh, manifestation, revelation of Christ. Christ, who was like us, 100% human being. But the jurisdiction, the jurisdictional part of the hierarchy of jurisdiction, gives us the title. So, for example, a patriarch can be someone who is the head of one local church and he is the one who presides with the assembly of the bishops of that local church he votes and everybody votes when they are supposed to make certain decisions he is first by honor but not by power not like the roman catholics where you have the pope who is on top of the pyramid and he can change whomever he likes the cardinals or any of the uh, other bishops and archbishop in the Roman Catholic Church, that doesn't exist in the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church is decentralized. Why? Because Christ never ordained one apostle, but he ordained 12. And uh, through them, many others who became, who created the multitude of the church. The jurisdictional part is, remember from the book of Acts, when the apostles realized there were so many people converting, becoming Christians, following Christ, they had to ordain seven deacons in order to administer the church, the gifts that were given to the church to distribute to the poor, to those who are in need, so that everyone uh, can be served. In similar way, when you hear the word someone is a patriarch, that's what it means. He's just a bishop, but his obedience to the church in this world is to serve his brothers and his church in the obedience, in the function of a patriarch. When you see that someone is a metropolitan, that comes because the metropolis is refers to a big city. He had the responsibility to, of organizing the church in a big region, a big city. And he would have bishops as his brothers who would serve with him, but he will be the one who would preside. He would be the one 
who would conclude and convene a certain, let's say, assembly in order to discuss certain matters of the church. That's the, what we call the human aspect of the church, the jurisdictional aspect of the church. When we talk about presbyter and proto-presbyter and so forth, proto-presbyteros means someone who is first among the priests, not by power, not that someone, this priest is somehow uh, has a bigger grace than the others or more importance, but rather his job is, as a proto he has some specific function of the church. We don't have time now to cover all the details about all the ranks of the jurisdictional aspect of the church or the hierarchy of jurisdiction, but it will take us too much time. But I want you to understand two basic things about the holy ordination. There is a hierarchy of ordination that is the one that Christ constituted in this world through the apostles and the Holy Spirit just prolonged that uh, unto the ages in the church for the past 2000 years. And that's the hierarchy of ordination. That's priest, that's uh, bishop, priest, deacon, and people, of course. And the hierarchy of jurisdiction that it, between the ranks of the bishop, priests, and deacons, there are multiple different ranks. But they're not um, jurisdictional in a sense of power, but rather by honor and obedience that they have in the church. Uh, so I think this is clear. Of course, we, we'll, we'll, we can come back if you want to, uh, if you want to cover this, this topic more and if you have, of course, any questions. But I just wanted to... Uh, share this uh, with you so you can kind of um, understand the, the differences between the hierarchy of ordination and the hierarchy of jurisdiction. The one that it's most important is the hierarchy of ordination. Who is a bishop, who is a priest, and who is a deacon. Women, because this is our topic, are also called to be missionaries to be witnesses and teachers of the faith, and even more, to be or become evangelists. We see from the fact that many women are being called by the Orthodox Church with the epithet or the attribute as the equal to the apostles. It's known to, it's known to everybody, I would assume. Uh, we're talking about women like you have here in the slide, like St. Mary Magdalene, St. Tecla, St. Nina, the Enlighter of Georgia, whom we just celebrated uh, last Friday with St. Sawa. We celebrate her on um, January the 27th. Then we have St. Helen. She's the mother of St. Constantine the Great. And we come all the way to St. Olga, uh, a Russian saint and so on. And we can probably mention so many more uh, women who are equal to the apostles and who were the teachers of the faith. And look at the, the beautiful attribute, the beautiful epithet that the church is given, equal to the apostles, in no way different than the apostles in the work that they did in this world. But they were never part of what we call the liturgical priesthood. But that doesn't minimize their royal priesthood. However, among the liturgical priesthood, we cannot find anywhere any examples, for the past 2,000 years at least, that women ever belonged. So the question is, why? So let's just try to cover now for, let's say, the practical reasons, and we'll come later to the most important theological reasons why women were never ordained as priests, as liturgical priests, not as priests. We all belong to the priesthood. As a matter of fact, Christ, in the gospel, he says that, don't you know that... Um, uh, in the kingdom of heaven, there shall be no male or female, but everyone will be like angels in front of God. And this is very true. But in this world, we, ha we have gender, and we are part of that, um, uh, part of that uh, creation of, of, of the Lord. So the first reason, let's say, that we can number, there are many, but let's say this, is because of pregnancy. A woman cannot become a priest especially when she's into some far past period of her pregnancy and even more after the birth of the baby. This means that she cannot physically perform the service of the priesthood. Meaning uh, when a woman is pregnant, uh, becoming the future mother, already being a mother by carrying a child, and even after the child is born, uh, her whole attention is usually around the child. And it's not an easy job to be able to uh, take care of uh, uh, take care of the of the liturgical aspect of, of the church. 
There is another reason, and this is something that uh, I want you to pay attention to. It's uh, sometimes confusing to, to all of us that a lot of people are talking about this, and it is the, the monthly period, the blood flowing. And there's, that's by many is considered to be another reason why women cannot be a priest. That doesn't mean that prevents them from becoming a royal, being a royal priesthood. Everybody's royal priesthood can be, but be part of the liturgical priesthood. Physically, very simply because of the bleeding. And when a woman bleeds, she cannot take the Holy Communion according to many uh, Orthodox uh, fathers. Why? And the logic goes like this. Because of the blood of our Lord gets into our bloodstream. And the moment that blood goes out of our body, even if we have some modern hygienic, let's say, solutions today, like we do, the blood has to be somehow be thrown away. And with that, the very blood of our Lord. So regarding this, some uh, uh, liberal teachers who advise that women that it is okay and is not obstacle for them to partake in the Holy Communion. They take arguments from St. Gregory the Theologian that we will talk. That's the first argument that uh, they say. And they said that because we live today in some modern times, we have some modern solutions which can overcome this obstacle. Just they're saying like the hygiene is the only reason uh, for this, why women, let's say, should not should or should not take the Holy Communion when they are on their period. I remember, just to clarify very simple, men can also not take the Holy, should not take the Holy Communion if they bleed. For example, I had one priest calling me, this was like four or five years ago, to serve a liturgy in his church. He asked me because he went to the dentist the day before and he had a, a very long surgery. So the next day he was still bleeding for his mouth. He said, can you please serve because then I cannot take Holy Communion. And it was a holiday, it was a feast. So, of course, I went there. The priest was there with me in the altar, doing everything, but he didn't take the Holy Communion for that very reason, that because he was bleeding, he didn't want to take the blood of Christ inside of himself and spill it out in, in different way. For that reason, please, uh, we need to understand how the Orthodox Church understands the Eucharist as well. We don't believe that the Eucharist is a metaphor or is an idea or it's some sort of a symbol. No, we truly believe that the body and blood of Christ and the water, the, the wine and the bread and the water become the body and blood of Christ. And even though they still preserve the form of wine and bread and water, they become, after the consecration of the gifts, the real Eucharist, the real body and blood of Christ. So the main argument of those who advise women to receive Holy Communion, even in their time of period, for example, it is because of the position of one saint, and this is St. Gregory the Dialogist. Uh, he was a patriarch of Rome, a pope, from the 6th century, and at the time the church was still one and orthodox. Uh, he's most known for his editing uh, of the liturgy of the presanctified gifts that we serve during the Great Lent. You will see every Wednesday here during the Great Lent. Uh, from 5.45, I think we put, uh, when the Great Lent starts, we'll serve it. That's basically Vespers with receiving the Holy Eucharist at the end. It was actually St. Gregory Diologist, the Pope of Rome, Patriarch, who actually edited, who composed this liturgy in order the way, in the shape and form that we have today. It was also not his, he didn't wrote it, but rather he popularized it, if you will. He made it mainstream and it became a beautiful tradition of the church to serve this during the <clears throat> Lenten days of the of the great land of the week. Uh, there is also another thing he's uh, also saying, and this is the saying who, uh, 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 in writing, he said it is okay for women who are in their period to receive Holy Communion. But let's say we need to mention two things. For example, those who advise that women should approach the chalice during their period and taking the opinion and the position of this great saint as their argument, they're leaving behind, or they're silent, at least intentionally, about the fact that first an isolated position of one saint in the Orthodox Church is never taken as a normative, something, let's say, what we call obligatory. It always must be a consensus or a symphony of agreement upon certain position or thought. This symphony of the saints on the other side is not to approach. And when we do not have a position regarding some question for many, for many saints, but just from a one, then this is taken as one very serious reference. But it is still not a canon or a rule on its own. 
meaning the isolated opinion of one saint cannot be taken as a canon. But that doesn't mean uh, that the saint, was, was, what he said was something wrong. Therefore, the position of St. Gregory the Dialogist differs from most saints, even though we still respect his opinion regarding this issue and nothing more than that, because the saint also says the following. If certain women do not want to take Holy Communion out of reverence and understanding of the holiness of the mystery, this is worthy of every praise and that those who still want to partake of the mystery of the Holy Communion, they do not do anything wrong. It is because of their reverence. It is also a question whether St. Gregory would correct his position, for example, if he would be alive and witness the council which discussed this man. St. Gregory reposed in the Lord in 604. While that's the beginning of the seventh century, while the mention, uh, for example, there's one Quinesec or five, the five, five sixth council, also known as the Council of Trullo, was convened in Constant, Constantinople in 692. This council confirmed the canons of St. Dionysius from the 3rd century and St. Timothy of the 4th century. They were both from Alexandria. These canons clearly, we will use the words uh, uh, advise, or the word advise women not to approach the holy mysteries under the mentioned circumstances. They don't say categorically don't take, but rather advise because of the arguments that we said before that. The other argument uh, that those who advocate, for example, about taking the Holy Communion regardless is when they call upon the event of the blood flowing woman from the gospel, which suffered for 12 years from this disease and upon touching Christ's fringe of his garment. She was healed. You know this story. We must notice two things about this. She has the disease of a constant blood flowing, which can be because of some personal sin. We cannot know this because it's not mentioned in scripture. But what we know for certain, for certain, certainly, is that the period women have is not a disease. It's natural. It's a biological phenomenon. And the woman is not unclean, for example, as some people might think. This is false and incorrect understanding, which belongs to the Old Testament folklore way of thinking. Nor she is guilty because of it. As we all know, this also belongs to the fallen human nature. There, for example, in Serbia, sometimes young women will ask the priest questions uh, like, well, I have my period, I, I'm not supposed to go even to the church. This is a false understanding that doesn't have anything to do with our spiritual uh, uh, cleanliness, our spiritual uh, pu uh, purification. For that reason, we need to be very careful. We will have to mention here that when someone is on his deathbed, let's say, is dying and needs to receive the Holy Communion, this condition is not an obstacle to receive the Holy Communion. Just as we do not forbid Holy Communion to someone who is ill and is in a need of the Holy Mysteries. That's why every parish priest has some of the dry Holy Communion, which is kept on the altar table. We call it Darocharitelinsa or Kivotion, Vuklion, for the need of the sick and for those who cannot come to church and receive the Holy Communion themselves. Also for prisoners, people who are not just still, but also from any other reason prevented or unable to, to come. Then the priest can do this for them when they want and when they need it, especially if there is a danger of someone, God forbid, dying. It is the same situation when a layman can baptize someone if the situation is dire and this person might lose his life. In this case, the layman can baptize just as priests would do. And then if that man survives, the priest can just come over later and fulfill, finish the, the whole mystery and chrismate the person, of course, given the Holy Communion. The same way a woman during her period with a blessing and because of spiritual discernment can receive the Holy Mysteries if the circumstances are such. But this cannot be relativized to a point that we should just tell uh, that it's okay in the name of, uh, because of the opinion of one saint. Because just a few years later, let's say in 690, uh, uh, 692, we see that there was a whole council that also adopted and discussed all this issue, and they had very clear understanding about it, which is the councils are the most highest authority in the church when it comes to 
the organization of the juridical church of, the, of this world. So this might not be very important, but it's worth mentioning, for example, that this blood flowing woman from the gospel that we see the icon here touched only the fringe of Christ's garment, but never his body. Of course, this is not relevant, just an observation from some people who said that, and it makes kind of interesting point. We can also refer to the position of our holy patriarch of blessed memory, Pavle, a man of holy life and of a good example who writes, I don't know if you have a picture of him here, but he, uh, has a, a wrote several books, actually book, but they're parted in, in several booklets regarding liturgical questions and answers. And he also says that, for example, women should not take Holy Communion during their period if there is not an important reason to do otherwise. So a priest or a bishop, even bishop, even they can discern, and because of their discernment, they can give the blessing according to the needs of the uh, specific circumstances. But the general rule is that out of reverence, that they should not approach. Also, there is another wrong and spread out misunderstanding which some women ask the priest, and this is what I mentioned to you when they go to church, that they, want, they should not kiss or venerate uh, the cross or the icon or their, uh, when they're in the period, or take even antidote, which is, of course, false. This is absolutely allowed to kiss and venerate the Christ since the period is a natural and losing of blood once a month is a natural thing. It's nothing to do with being unclean or anything like that. This is very important to understand. It's so important to, to, important to note that the same rule applies for the priests. So for example, if the priests are uh, defiled in any way, or they, they for example, uh, have unclean night and so forth, they should not serve the liturgy until they do confession and do their prayers or, uh, and ask God for forgiveness. They should not serve the liturgy or receive the Holy Communion, for example, if they bleed, as I mentioned the example with myself. So women also have period of, there is another reason, of hormonal temptations, which can reflect on her psychological state. So imagine now a woman in a state in, uh, if she's, let's say, uh, uh, during that time, and if she's a priest, someone comes for confession to her. Or who knows how many times people come for confession and do they confess the same thing? It is challenging whether the, the, the priestess would have the uh, necessary patience to confess this person. And there are many other similar examples that just they are not fitting sometimes to our psychological stability. But let us dive in into the most important answer, which is what is the theological reasons why women cannot be ordained priests and why in the Orthodox Church uh, this is the case. Maybe these are the most important reason, and uh, probably mo for most of, the, most of the things that I'm going to tell you, we're not going to find them in some books or canons or regulations, but you will probably, you will find them in the, what we call the holy tradition of the church. You will not find them in a written form, but you will hear it uh, from, the, from the mouth of the, of the fathers, uh, of the saints of the church, and so forth. And that is that the bishop, and through his blessing, all the priests who are serving under him, as we call it, under the homophorion of the bishop, and commemorate him during the divine, divine liturgy, they all iconize our Lord Jesus Christ. What does this mean in simple words? It means that they, the priesthood, when they serve the liturgy, they make Christ present among all of us. They make him physically visible and tangible as Christ was among the apostles, full human and what he is like in the kingdom of God. Because let us not forget when Christ ascends into heaven, he ascends with his theantropic nature, with being still full human, still full God. When he comes back on his second coming, the way we're going to recognize him will be through the piercing that we had the last time when we talked about the book of Revelation. He carries them as trophies, as the insignia in which we will recognize our true Christ, not the false Christ who will try to rule the world and all of us. This means that Christ has full human nature, that he deified it, of course, and that he was, i.e., uh, he is a man by body as well. He is the only priest in the liturgy with a twofold service. 
Probably you've noticed many times I say that we, the priests, the bishops, we are nothing more than just a positive zero. It is not us who serve the liturgy. It is only Christ who serve the liturgy. The priests and the bishops and the deacons, we just represent Christ visible, manifested, just like his, his was among the apostles, a tangible person, a person that you can touch, a person that you can hug, a person that you can kiss, you can punch, you can, who can bleed, who can sweat, who can be cold, and so on and so forth. He was not an orama. He was not a, uh, an apparition. He was a real human being. He is a real human being. So offer the pre, uh, Christ is the one who he offers himself to God the Father and simultaneously liturgizes. He serves the divine liturgy in front of all the faithful in the church. He is the one, Christ, who gives the mysteries to his own, the faithful. So when we kiss the hand of a bishop or a priest or a deacon, we do not kiss his hand, but the one of Christ whom he represents in the liturgy. It is the hand that touches the body of Christ, and then the hand that gives the blessing is the hand of Christ, not of the priest. This is very important to know that the priesthood is the one uh, who, who, when they serve the liturgy, they just are serving Christ. Christ is the one who offers himself and who is being offered. He is the one who does everything. We, the priests, we are what we call the antiprosopim. We are ek prosopi to Christu. We are the representative of Christ. We are not the vicars of Christ. This is the one main reason, main difference, for example, the Roman Catholic theology that went away, astray, by saying that we need a vicar in the face, say, let's say the Pope, who will take upon himself the humanity and he will represent Christ. He will be some sort of an intermediator between us and God. It is like Christ went on a vacation and now we need the Pope to be some sort of a substitute between us and God. In the Orthodox Church, that's not the case. In the Orthodox Church, when the bishop is serving the divine liturgy, he is visibly presenting Christ among us. Even though he himself does not serve, it is Christ who serves through him. He has to take responsibility of how he serves the liturgy. That's why all of us, the priests, before we serve, we have few days of preparation. We can't just go... Let's say all night, all day before that, do certain things and uh, go to parties or, or be with people all the time and, and do things. And then just I wake up next morning and I go to church and serve. There is a prayer rule I have. To do. There is some period of fasting I have to follow. There is some certain things that we need to observe in order to serve the divine liturgy. Because ultimately, none of us is worthy to serve, but Christ is the one who serves the liturgy. And because of that, we need to take uh, that place in Christ um, are very serious because we're not serving in place of Christ is the one who serves. The priest is just the rep the priests are just the representatives. Those who are giving themselves in, offering their bodies, offering themselves, their time, their sacrificial offering, just like all of us do, in order Christ to serve the liturgy so he can give himself back to us. In to conclude, in very deep understanding theological there is no difference between a uh, huge difference between the royal priesthood all of us all the people who are part of the orthodox church being baptized being chrismated and the liturgical priesthood there is a difference in in this world in a sense of how they are what is their obedience in the church but because christ only ordained men to be uh, the liturgical priesthood the church protects and preserves this tradition. As I said in the very beginning, when the babushkas give the answer, why don't we have women being ordained in the priesthood in the Orthodox Church? And when they say, because it was always like that, that's the best answer. The very holy tradition of the church tells us that there is a reason why women were not ordained as priests. I just mentioned a few of them, practical and, and theological reasons, but there are many other more reasons. The attempts that we see in the last few decades that we need to ordain diaconists, that we need to do, even the deaconesses in the church, they were never part of the liturgical priesthood. Yes, they were at some point, but they were forbidden in the church, in the Byzantine Empire, for some reasons that 
when we have time, we'll talk about it. We don't have time to talk about it now. But I wanted to explain to all of you, as much as I can, the time allows us to understand that the Orthodox Church takes the priesthood very seriously. And in the, uh, in the church, only men in this visible church can be ordained in, in the holy priesthood. In that way and shape, from just as we saw the example of St. Tecla, St. Theodora, St. Paraskevi, or St. Uh, um, Helen, the mother of St. Constantine Great, St. Olga, and so many women, they're called equal to the apostles. In no difference between St. Peter, St. Paul, and St. Tecla, or St. Nina of Georgia, in their honor in front of God, because they're both part of the royal priesthood, and the liturgical priesthood. As a matter of fact, it will be very uh, wrong if we somehow try to elevate one of the priesthood on the other. They're both the same. In Christ, what Christ needs from us, he needs our hearts and our repentance because ultimately, especially for the liturgical priest, it is Christ who is the, the, the only priest. He is the real priest. All of us are priests because of him, but he is the true priest. We're just uh, serving in his obedience. I hope all of this makes sense. I don't want to uh, confuse you or, or try to kind of uh, sound too um, theological and maybe unclear. So if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, to ask. But I hope that so far this all makes sense. And you can uh, maybe understand better why in the Orthodox Church, women cannot become priests. There's nothing to do with ideology or any kind of um, political understanding. But we see today that unfortunately, a lot of um, so-called churches or denominations have allowed women to become priests and have broken the 2000 year old tradition of the church. For that reason, the Orthodox Church cannot um, uh, break away from, from that tradition. So glory to God. That's all I have to share with you today. Next Tuesday, we'll continue with the book of Revelation. And we're going to take it uh, even more uh, deeper into, uh, we'll finish the first chapter of the book of Revelation. And we'll move on to the very important topic of uh, the letters of uh, the letter or the, the book of Revelation written by St. John and the message of Christ to the seven churches in Asia Minor. So that will be all for, uh, for now. Any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, and if not, then we can uh, maybe read the prayers and we can uh, wrap it up for, for tonight. To Paulina and... and uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Father. Yeah, just a really quick comment. Um, I really appreciated this. This was very, very helpful because um, it's something that often is it's lumped into a category of, well, they're just another, you know, patriarchal society with, you know, lower respect for women. And it's totally not the case. Of so um, I, I really, I really appreciate the, that. Um, the other thing too, is just the idea of change. And um, I remember reading just shortly ago, I think, I believe it was in Proverbs where it said, be careful of those who are quick to change or, or are constantly changing or moving the ancient boundaries. So, yeah. you know, you, you, you see these, these warnings way back that just because something is new doesn't mean we have to embrace it. Exactly. Exactly. And, and thank you for bringing that point. Uh, because uh, as we have said many times, and Father Athanasius Mithilineos, the last time he warned us about the greatest enemy of the church is the lukewarmness, because we can read that in the in the writings of the the Red Book of Revelation. But the other one that we are seeing it unfolding in front of our eyes is the secularization of the church. Right. The attempt of the society to modernize the church according to the needs of the people today. So, for example. Uh, we just talked about this, I think, on, on Sunday or, or Saturday, I don't remember. Uh, we talked about that we can make idol out of God. And when we, especially when we refer to Christ as the personal Jesus. So basically, everybody believes in Christ in his own way and creates his own religion and fights with the other who has the right and who has better or, or, or uh, worse arguments. 
And ultimately, we shape our God according to our own needs. That's a definition of what idol is. And we will have a special lecture with the help of Father Athanasios talking specifically about what an idol is. And because we do this, because we are fallen as human beings, we allow all and everything to enter into the most sacred aspect of the church, and that is the divine liturgy. Uh, we have to understand that the words of Christ, the first shall be the last, and the last shall be the first, are referring to all of us who are understanding the carrying of our cross in this life with humility. And uh, if we think that becoming a priest or a bishop will somehow bring us more grace, that's a great deception, a great delusion. So the attempt of the world to impose itself into the church in the way it does, through homosexual marriages, through all this different stuff that they're happening and they're trying to do, it all depends on, uh, it's basically an ancient deception of the serpent. It all depends on what kind of stance we're going to take as Orthodox Christians. Uh, are we going to allow those things to happen? Are we going to be lukewarm? Or are we going to say, no, and we're going to preserve and stay within the bosom of the church, which is uh, being kept for the past 2,000 years. I want you to all know uh, when we're going to talk about the Nicolaites and some other heresies from the time of St. John, uh, the theologian, when he was writing the book of Revelation, a lot of Gnostics and so forth, there were people who were doing a very similar things of what we see today. There is nothing new under the sun but Christ. That's why all these attempts, for example, to ordain women into the priesthood, I will be honest with you, it is possible in many denominations because they are not a church. In the church, that's never possible. And now, who is the church who is not the church? I, I will leave that for all of you to kind of dwell upon and think about that. Uh, however, it is a serious issue. Uh, I, my, this is my personal opinion. Uh, I think that these are attempts to secularize the church so it can be unrecognizable and it's a form of mockery of, of christ that's what it is but uh god god help us all i think that uh there is a reason in some of the most simple answers when people um give that um we should listen to to, to those like those babushka they say because it was always like that there is a deep philosophy in that. Deep, deep meaning in that, deep consolation, I find. Uh, on the other hand, I just wanted to say to Paulina uh, that we, uh, Paulina, at the beginning, if you were there, we, we, I tried to give an answer to the question of why do we say unto the ages of ages. I will also send you a short article also to, to read the historical aspect of it, but um, we'll pause, post this on YouTube and we'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, is there any, any questions, guys, about this topic or that will be all for, for now? If not, uh, we can uh, finish for today. We can say the prayer. And uh, God willing, we'll see you um, next Tuesday for sure. Uh, tomorrow, it's very likely that we might not have the the, catechi the Bible studies. It is because I don't know if I'm going to make it on time. I have to drive uh, to New Jersey. And if I come around 5 o'clock, of course, we'll, we'll log in. But I'll, I'll text you all, I'll, I'll email you all in case it has to be canceled. However, we'll continue as usual uh, in the following uh, week. Okay, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and in the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, what of mercy, what of mercy, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and in the ages of ages. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Father, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Thank you all, guys, uh, for being here. Uh, we'll see you, if not tomorrow, we'll see you for sure.